it's just an outlet to get away, mm-hmm. you know, because when I fish, typically it's very far away from everybody. The middle, I'm like in the middle of nowhere. And it's just nice, you know, there's no sirens, there's no people complaining to you, there's no people yelling at you. Um, you're just able to be out there and appreciate what you're doing, whether you're catching fish or not. You appreciate the the setting, the scenery, the, you know, shooting stars, the moon. It's because most of the fishing is done at night and it's, you just get to relax and just think about how grateful you are for everything you have going on and your ability to be out there and you're still, you know, heart's still beating, you're still breathing, you're good. Mike, Mike Cunahan, how Sorry. you doing? Nice to meet you. Or, nice. nice to be here. Really. Yeah, I know, man. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I had a blast, man. It's been such a good good couple days. Yeah. Super excited to be here. Big fan of the show for a long time. And just to be out here on the water with you guys is just like blew my mind. Well, you're quite a fisherman back home. Yeah, I do a little bit here and there. It's schedule, you know, limited due to schedule, but I, I get it in when I can. What is your schedule? So, I mean, for people that don't know, you're a police officer in New York, Yeah, right? I'm a cop up in New York. Um, I have a pretty steady schedule now. It's just long. You know, my days start at, you know, 3.30 in the morning. I wake up and I got to be at work for five. And, you know, I'm usually out by, you know, early afternoon, but. <clears throat> it's an hour commute home, so hour commute home, and then yeah. when do you when? Where's the gym? Gym's after that. After so. that, at that's home. When, or that's what? when the real work starts. Not at home yet. It will be soon. I'm working on the gym at home now, but uh, I usually get a, you know work out in at a local gym up by me, close to your house. Yeah, like real close, but it's an hour north of the city. So now have you over the years have you played with closer to work, closer to home? Like what's the what's the the best balance for you i think closer to home is easy this way i get the commute out of the way and then i go straight to the gym and then i go home Mm -hmm. you know if i go home i don't go to the gym it's just it just doesn't happen i'll fall asleep or something that's that's what i used to do like um when i was running a lot if i walked into the i mean you you see it after we've been doing this for a couple days right like this the sun is like Mm -hmm. serious it takes life out of you you walk into the ac Mm -hmm. and there's very little chance you're walking back out exactly you're just so i used to leave my running Mm -hmm. shoes in the in the truck oh yeah and i used to just pull up in front of my house Mm -hmm. put some shorts on get right after before i ever even walked in there's been many a times where i pulled up to the gym and i'm like oh my god i'm so tired but I ended up taking a, I've ended up taking a nap in the gym parking lot in my car for like 15, 20 minutes. And then I shoot straight into the gym and I'm like, all right, let's go. Let's get so, it. So that's not necessarily um, like if you were to consult your 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 whoop strap or your your Fitbit oh. or something, it's going to tell you mm-hmm. like it's not train not right ideal. Now. Yeah. No. But there's times you got to, you know, it, it's either you do or you don't, because if I didn't get it in, if you know, if I waited, it wouldn't happen at all. I, I'm with so, you. So there's some days you got to push through that stuff. Yeah. You know? That's more but there is a balance that. there for for like gain, <clears throat> like 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 making improvements, and and not like based upon how tired you are. I mean, the all the science and the the gurus tell you that y- you 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 should rest, but then the David Goggins of the yeah. world are like, let's go, not today, yep. <laughs> not it's today. True. I mean, listen, I, that Mark Bell did a video years ago. And it was him talking about some guy he, that like messaged him. He's like, "Oh, you got to listen to your body and let your central nervous system rest." And he's like, "Dude, I got it. I'm like, let Thanks. me do my thing." And he's, for he help. was a little bit more vulgar about it, and uh, that was just a very motivating video for me. And I would listen to it while I trained. The video's got like millions of views, and I'm probably responsible for a few <laughs> hundred thousand of them. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, you reached in and uh, use whatever you can to motivate you, whether uh-huh. it be situations or quotes or. You know, speeches, music, I've used it all to motivate me. So I've pushed through some really uh, interesting times. I've used bad incidents, bad situations I've been in to motivate some of my workouts. And that's what you do what you got to do to push through. Well, one of the ones that you talk about pretty openly is is a, is a, uh, something that happened at work mm. where had you not been in as good yeah. shape as you are, had you not been training, maybe you might not have made it home. You Can you um, talk about that at all? Yeah, like what yeah, happened? Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a long story, but we got a lot of time. Me, me and my partner <laughs> asked, this was early on in my career. I had only a couple of years on. I would have handled the situation much differently now, being older and a little bit more experienced. But uh, a couple of years on the job, we we're driving out. Um, we were taking a prisoner to one of the hospitals up in the Bronx. And uh, 
I dropped my partner off with this guy and I had to go back to my command. I was going into tour. I was ready to go home. <clears throat> so I'm taking a slow ride back, hitting all the lights. And, uh, I see this, this very large guy beating on this smaller guy. And I was like, Oh no, mm. I'm in a marked police car. I'm like, this is not happening right now. It was my last, it was, it was like my Friday night. I'm ready to go home. And I'm like, Oh man, this sucks. So everybody's looking at me now like, Hey, you going to do something? And they pour out into the street from the sidewalk into the street, uh, right in front of my car. And this guy's just on top of him, pounding him. I'm like, oh man. So I turn the lights on, hit the siren. I'm like, hey guys, break it up, break it up. I hit the siren. This guy looked up and looked right at me. I was like, oh man, this is bad. <laughs> he comes out and starts punching the, the passenger window of my car. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Now looking back, hindsight's 2020, I would have been like, uh, all right, I would have switched over to the right channel because I was in another precinct. I would have switched over to the right channel. Hey guys, listen, I got a situation here. This guy's high on PCP. I need a hand. I need a few guys. It's going to get nasty. Me being 25, whatever it was, I got out of the car, I slammed the door. And by the time I turned around, this guy was on top of me, punching mm. me. I'm like, oh, dude, you got to be kidding me. All I want to do is go home. And, uh, you know, he, I push him off and he start fighting and he, scre- he rips his shirt off. You can't hurt me. And he's screaming and stuff. I'm like, oh, my God. He's like foaming at the mouth and stuff. Turns out he was high on PCP and it took uh, quite a struggle to get him off of me. And in the struggle, he went for my gun and I was like, you know, they teach you to lock your hand down for weapon retention and, you know, fight the guy off. But so my strong hand's on my gun. So I'm fighting this guy off my left hand. He's substantially bigger than me. And um, it was just, it was an eye opening situation Mm -hmm. to fight that guy off. And, you know, if it was somebody else that didn't train or wasn't, you know, conditioned, that guy probably would have took their gun and, you know, somebody takes your gun, they're going to, they're going to use it on you right. more than likely. So it was an eye open experience to, for me to, to be like, wow, like there's a lot of cops out there that really don't put themselves first or don't take the proper steps to train properly or, or eat properly and condition themselves for this job and for the potential that we see every day. And, uh, that's what really started the, the whole no zone Tiro thing on social media and, um, encouraging people to, to really, you know, make themselves a priority so they can be the best cop. They could be the best mother, the best father and really, you know, put themselves up to the next level. So, yeah, well, it's really taken off. Yeah. I mean, you're really helping a lot of people. That's how mm-hmm. I, that's how I uh, ended up following you before I even had knew of the connection between Justin and, yeah. and you or anything. And he mentioned you and I was like, Oh, I know that guy. Mm-hmm. But I, I had seen like some of the stuff that you had done and there were a lot of people there. Um, just kind of, it, it's really cool how, you know, but it, sometimes it takes like a, like an event like that of some sort, mm-hmm. like that one's pretty extreme. Yeah. Right. But it, sometimes it takes something like that to really put your focus on, on that. Cause otherwise, how do you tie together this, this whole fitness life that you have and this whole mm-hmm. police life that you have and tying it together? Even, even some of the things that we were talking about earlier, like, even the the brass the 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 upper higher ups don't mm-hmm. don't understand it. Like, where yeah. where are you going with this? Like, what's up? Yeah, what's going I mean, on with this? they they weren't sure what my motive was. You know, my angle. We've had people in the past, like many many years ago, try to use the job as like, you know, try to work use the job as to progress themselves and to move themselves forward, which really wasn't really my motive. But um, I saw an opportunity to help people because there's a lot of people that really need help because, you know, first responders, whether it be cops, firemen, EMS, you're always putting everybody else first, whether it be your family or the people you're working with or working for, um, you know, you're usually put to the back burner on a personal level. So I wanted to to let people know, like, listen, you got to make yourself a priority. You have to work on yourself, whether it be training and nutrition or finding that work-life balance, which, you know, some people say, oh, well. You know, if you want to be successful at something, you got to, there is no work-life balance, mm. but there really should be. So even from a mental health standpoint, you know, you want to, <clears throat> if you don't have something, some kind of outlet outside of this job, mm-hmm. you'll go crazy. Yeah. You know, that's why we've seen so many suicides in the last few years and they've been on the decline. You know, we had one year where it was like 12 people committed suicide and it was just. Just out of your group? Just on my job alone. Yeah. So. That's we terrible. Had a, we had a tough couple of years. So that's why, that's why they took uh you really took the initiative to really go after the physical fitness and try to reap the mental health benefits from that as well. So is there going to have to be like a, a, a major shift in maybe, maybe it's back at the Academy or something to where it's like instilled that 
in order to be successful here, you also need to be physically fit. And, and uh, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how you do that necessarily because, like, you have physical fitness tests mm-hmm. in the in police, I'm yeah. sure, and, and mm-hmm. fire and certainly in the Army and the Navy, oh, yeah. the Air Force, all that. You have those those physical fitness tests, but it's different where it's not like you don't look at it as, well, one time a year I'm going to need to pass a test. Yeah. Because there's no, there's no standard once you graduate the academy. There's no standard. Really? For most places, yeah. So it's to get in the academy and to graduate the academy, and you're on your own after that. But now they're making it. I mean, it's they're in a tough spot from a union standpoint, and there's some political stuff and legal stuff where they can't mandate you. All right, you have to do this every year, you know. Yeah. But they've made. Well, you mean even a physical fitness test? Yes, from a wow. physical fitness standpoint. Um, but they have made uh, a lot of programs available to us and uh that's kind of what i'm part of now so you know and my- so is, is the idea that that you don't mandate this but you just kind of you know it's almost like a mentality of mm-hmm. like yeah you're gonna be i mean if if you think about like the navy seals or something like that that is part of the mentality like if you're gonna be a seal you're gonna be in top physical yeah. shape like you're gonna go be- delta you're gonna you're go any of the best. kind of yep. any kind of um special forces mm-hmm. that's like part of it like there's this whole physical mm-hmm. culture it's expected it, of you right mm-hmm. it but but somewhere along the line that it's not the case in in the police yeah. is what you're telling me yeah i mean i'm not sure and, and how it works you know, you know you're not speaking for all police but no, just, no no not at all but it it is it has been refreshing to see within the last five or ten years you know it was fitness was kind of like taboo mm. you know taking accountability and and really working on yourself was kind of like made fun of i was made fun of at least but now to see the shift and see cops be like, all right, I got to go to the gym. You know, I got to drink my water. I have to hit my macros. I have to bring my meals with me. And to really make themselves and their fitness a priority in their life is it's cool to see. And you see the difference out there, I think. Hmm. <clears throat> and what about the the idea, like one of the things that's just super important to you is is fishing and getting outside. And, mm-hmm. and, and we were talking about it earlier. Like if you in this job that's super stressful and, and, and all consuming, if you don't have something outside, um, of the job that could be troubling, yeah, right? Absolutely. So you, one of the things that you suggest is to have a hobby of some sort. And does that, that, that certainly doesn't have to be fishing. No, I mean, but for be, you, what is, anything. what has fishing done like to, oh, to stabilize you, to, to enhance your, mm-hmm. your life? It's just an outlet to get away, you mm-hmm. know, because when I fish, typically it's very far away from everybody in the middle. I'm like in the middle of nowhere and it's just nice. You know, there's no sirens. There's no people complaining to you. There's no people yelling at you. Um, you're just able to be out there and appreciate what you're doing, whether you're catching fish or not. You appreciate the the setting, the scenery, the you know, shooting stars, the moon. It's because most of the fishing is done at night and it's. You just get to relax and just think about how grateful you are for everything you have going on and your ability to be out there and you're still, you know, heart's still beating. You're still breathing. You're good. Dude, that gratitude, that is mm-hmm. that's the most powerful thing Absolutely. of all. Sometimes, you know, I don't know. Sometimes it takes being away from something and yeah. then you get back to mm-hmm. it and you're like super grateful yeah. for it or whatever. Yeah. But then other times, you know, it's you, you just you just maintain that gratitude. Mm-hmm. Like you're just super happy to be there. So you, the fishing that you're doing, your area... Um, beach fishing on foot for stripers mostly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Usually stripers. We get some bluefish mixed in, but um, it's all over the Northeast. I've, I'll fish anywhere from Jersey up to Massachusetts and everywhere in between. Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York. Um, <clears throat> some guys will push out and they'll you know we'll, we'll all put the wetsuits on most of us and we'll we'll push out to some rocks. Some guys swim out there. I, don't, I try to stay away from that stuff. But um, so when you're saying push out like chest deep water, waist no, deep water. Like, Deep, deep water. Deep water. That's, like you're swimming out there, basically. These guys are, a lot of guys are swimming but out you, there. you, no, what do you do like that. to do? I'll do I'll do chest deep out to a rock or climb up onto a rock. And but I, in that situation, it's better just to wear a full wetsuit than yeah, to just try for, to go just with waders safety, and all for that. For safety reasons, yeah. You take a good wave over you and you get water in your waders, you're, you're done. Yeah. You know? Right. So it's it's a safer to wear the wetsuit and, it's, you know, sometimes it's more comfortable. So what's your <laughs> season on uh, when you're that far up in New York? I mean, I'm somewhat familiar with the striper mm-hmm. migration, but what? Like, what do you consider like the, you know, the first opening days of the season and when, and how do you, how do you manage your year like that? It's usually, I forget when opening day is actually, we usually get them, uh, late March, early April. Mm -hmm. We'll start getting some schoolies and then some bigger ones will push through from there. And then we kind of lose them in the summertime. We'll have them through June and then July, August, they're kind of gone and we'll have to chase them up in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, 
Um, but then the fall run is like prime time for us. You know, we'll get them up and down the coast of Long Island. Uh, Are they going the same direction? Like they were moving north before, they and then you north, don't see them. Then they're and gone, then, and then they come back down oh, south. they come back, okay. And they go back to like oh, Chesapeake Bay That's area. what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. I was wondering if that was what was happening, or if you're getting a second push going in the same direction. No, so they'll go up north for the summertime, and then uh, they'll come back down for the fall, and they'll push down by like Virginia. Mm-hmm. And so what do you think they're eating when they're when they're on that migration? I mean, I know that they're going through lots of different areas, just like the tarpon here. I mean, mm-hmm. it'd be like asking what a tarpon eats. And it's like they eat well, pretty much everything mm-hmm. that, that they encounter. And it could be eels. It could be it could be um, all type, all different types of bait fish. It could be shrimp and crabs, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure the stripers probably do the same. But I know that they use a lot of eels up mm-hmm. there and a lot of worms and sand, sand worms. And then they have like a palolo worm. Like we have a palolo lolo worm hatch mm-hmm. here it yeah. drives a tarpon crazy but mm-hmm. then there's another is it a cinder worm or what so, is that worm so we have up in the rivers guys will in some of the back bays guys will use sand worms and blood worms um but when the cinder cinder worm hatch happens it's we i fished it in long island they won't hit anything else because mm-hmm. they're so dialed right. in on that little worm worm. It's the same thing with the tarpon here yeah. the, 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 tar, the, mm-hmm. the palolo worms are about three and a half inches mm-hmm. long and and they they make the tarpon drunk. Yeah, they really do. Do yeah. the stripers act the same way? They act. Yeah, they like, won't. They won't touch anything else. It doesn't matter what you throw at them. How you try to replicate that particular little worm, they won't touch anything hmm. else. It's because and there's so many of them. Where it's, you know they're dialed in on that. But they they'll eat anything from crabs, lobsters, uh, bunkers, a big one, uh, spearing, anchovies, all kinds of little white bait and stuff like that. But for the most part, if you throw an eel out there, it doesn't matter. I've caught stripers with fish hanging out of their mouths and they're still, mm-hmm. e- still eating eels. It's crazy. <laughs> they crazy. love the eel. It's something ingrained in their DNA where they see an eel and they have to eat it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I don't know if I want to fish with eels, but I wouldn't mind fishing with um, eel like things. Yeah. Like, I, mean, uh, I, I throw a lot of soft plastics to replicate yeah. eels. Hoagies. Yeah. Is that what you like do? That. Hoagies, uh, GT eels, all kinds of, you know, there's so many soft plastic companies now. Yeah. But um, live eels is. It's king. It's, it's almost like cheating. It's crazy. Well, you know, there's something to that, though, to, to like as far into fishing as you want to go. And if there's if there's something like the other day we went permit fishing and I like to fly fish for permit. And I spent a lot of time fly fishing for permit. Mm-hmm. And a permit's favorite food is live is a, is a crab. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just they, they like to eat that. They eat lots of other things, but they like live crabs. And I love permit. And I'll catch them on fly. I'll catch them on, on jigs and other things like that. And that's that's fine. But to see them eat a live crab is especially mm-hmm. satisfying. Yeah. Because, dude, they just crush it. Yep. And it's just like you're talking about with the, mm-hmm. with the striper. Like, there's something in their DNA. When they see that thing... They're gonna they're yeah. gonna eat it if it's properly it's, presented. We'll also we'll take we'll we'll skin an eel and do a do a rig deal and you get a bite on a rig deal. It's it's like it's like a freight train. Man. Yeah, they they just crush those things. So yeah, they're a lot of fun. Did you grow? How did you get started in striper fishing? I mean, I grew up doing regular freshwater fishing. You know, as a kid, we did. You can move that thing up. It kind of bends. We, we did, um, <clears throat> you know, sunfish bluefish or bluegill uh, perch stuff like that and then me and my brother kind of took it a step further we got into bass fishing he went stayed in the freshwater world he does all competitive bass fishing now and i would kind of straight off when my buddy called me up he's like hey let's go try catching these stripers in the hudson <laughs> river because you know we live like 15 minutes from the river and um i was like all right let's take a shot so we were throwing like sandworms and uh we did all right you know i had no idea what i was doing we did all right and i started doing some research i'm like well they migrate up the river, hmm. they spawn, and they come back down the river. And then when they're done, they go out to the beaches. I was like, I like the beach. <laughs> I like the <laughs> yeah, fish. Yeah, I like the beach. I was like, this sounds awesome. I'm this in. sounds like my kind of fishing. Yeah. So, um, you know, I started throwing bait. And then I was like, well, they, they throw plugs for this. And we started throwing tins. And then it's funny, like, the progression. It's like bait, tins. What's tins? Uh, just like uh, spoons, pretty okay, much. Like yeah. metal, just metal. Oh, tin, like tins. T-I-N. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so they'll throw uh, bait, tin, uh, metal, and then just different kind of plugs, bucktails, metal lips, and stuff like that. And then the progression as you get older, and then you go work back down, and you start throwing the metal again, and then you work your way back to bait as you get older. Just kind of hang out I, and drink some I, beers. I tell you what, man, after you've done all that kind of fishing, mm-hmm. and you throw a, a, a live eel out there, and they just crush it, I, I promise you, it, it's almost like it brings you back to your youth. Like, mm-hmm. I enjoy all types of fishing, but... 
I got a special place in my heart for putting a cricket on a hook and, and seeing a bluegill pull, <laughs> yep. a, pull a cork yep. under. Yep. Like, that's pretty awesome. It brings and you I back to your childhood. And I haven't it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I, like, that's how I taught my kids to, to fish in fresh water. Like, we, we, we did that. Like, mm-hmm. pull, pull a cork under. And there's something about that, man. And there's something about watching a permit eat a live crab. And there's something probably about, you know, watching a striper eat a, eat a live eel. It's just, I don't know. It just, there's like... I think it, I think what it is is that that it triggers a lot of memories, just yeah. like like you just said, like nostalgia. But mm-hmm. it's like it, it it brings you back to your youth, and it kind of brings you back to all the excitement that. Uh, and not everybody feels like this. A lot of people poo poo bait, you know. Yeah. And like mm-hmm. I don't, oh, I wouldn't fish with bait. But at one point you enjoyed it, yeah. right? And you will enjoy it again once you can't fish right. plugs anymore, right? You know, because every fisherman has like this, has like this. Um, there are these cycles you go through. Mm-hmm. Like just like you were talking about, you 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 fish the bait, and then the tens, and then the lures, and then the jigs, and then the soft plastics, and then whatever you think is the 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 hardest, and then you know you're looking for the for like th- just any fish, and then you're looking for a lot of them, mm-hmm. and then you're looking for like a big one, yep. and then you're looking for oh well I might want to learn how to fly fish, and then then it's like any fish on fly, mm-hmm. and then it's like big fish on fly. You start and targeting specific yeah. fish. Then it's like, well, I wanted to species. be doing this when I catch them. I wanted mm-hmm. to eat on the surface. Yeah. And then, then after you do that for a while, you're just kind of like, eh, I could just mm-hmm. do whatever now. Yeah. And but I, it's, uh, I've that like to go back to what I said. Like that's you need something like that to take your mind off all the madness you yes. see every day, especially in you know a stressful career. Whether no matter what it is, whether it be cop, lawyer, you know, doctor, whatever, surgeon, you need an outlet. You need something to take your mind off, and it's. So many guys in my profession get so engulfed, like they let the, the job consume their lives. And, you know, they, that's why the divorce rate is so high. And, you know, you don't have a good relationship with your kids and all this stuff because you're work 24 seven. Mm. It's, you know, I, I admire the dedication to the job, but, you know, you have to put yourself and your family first, I think. Well, it's, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about, what we talked about earlier when we were doing the physical Friday, it reminded me a lot of being a fishing guy because being a fishing guy, especially in the Florida Keys here, it's it's all consuming as well because it can be very competitive. Um, you're certainly not having people pull guns on you and try to wrestle you down and stuff like that. But all the same traps are there. Like you're putting everybody in front of you. Like your customers come first, and mm-hmm. this guy's doing this, and somebody calls for a for a trip on your only day off, and then you book it. You know, because it's an mm-hmm. expensive place to live here. Yeah. And then um, all your the only people that you're socializing with are other fishing guides and it's only at the ramp. And then mm-hmm. you talk all day long and talk and talk and talk and entertain. And then when you get home, you want to shut down. That's when your wife wants yep. to talk, but you want to shut down. Mm-hmm. It's all the same traps. Like, yep. it, and, and it, it, it's almost like, like for the mental health kind of discussion that it's not just, cops and first responders and and hospitality workers fishing guides and people that put other people in front of them all the time but it's like everybody like everybody needs exercise everybody needs good nutrition everybody needs an outlet that gets their brain off of whatever is consuming them most of the time like Mm -hmm. all of the things that you're saying are like on the extreme end, because you're talking about your profession, like being mm-hmm. a police officer or a first responder, that's it, obviously it applies to absolutely everyone. Yeah. You know, I mean, whatever, you, whether you want to be the best father, the best mother, the best, whatever, you know, you should be taking, taking care of yourself and eating the right food and, and just exercising and being the best possible version of yourself. And that's something we talk about with first form. And, you know, that's their goal is to get everybody to become the best version of themselves. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, do you, do you think that, like we're we're moving towards that. Like, do you see progress in that? Because, or or progress in just a certain segment of the population that's interested in that. I think a lot more people are taking it, taking their health and fitness seriously. There's still a huge population or part of the population that aren't. You know, and you can see that in the news and whatever. Well, but uh, there are there is a huge community of people that are taking care of themselves and are encouraging other people to do the same. It's interesting. Sometimes, um, like in the in the CrossFit world, they, they have a, a journal and they do a good job of writing stuff and I read it. But one of the things that I remember an article, it was like, we have the the unhealthiest 
population we've ever had. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have the healthiest population that we've ever had with all these CrossFitters and all these uh, Spartan racers and bodybuilders and uh, triathletes and marathoners, all these people that are that are like so into this physical realm and 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 doing things like 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 with the first form products and with with all the recovery things and and you can now be an aging athlete i'm 53 Mm -hmm. years old and i don't even think that i'm even close to my potential right like Mm -hmm. there's a lot of other things that i want to do and i don't feel like oh man my the good days are behind me i don't feel like that at Mm -hmm. all i feel like if there's something i want to do all i've got to do is train for it properly and Mm -hmm. probably you know have a i mean i don't even have a, a thing in my head that's like well I could, probably not going to be able to do it like I used to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Like why? Why wouldn't you I be able to? You get to push the you, limits if you can just train for it. But but the interesting thing is like uh, there's like two ends of the spectrum, which today it seems like there's two ends of the spectrum on a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> on politics, yes. on mm-hmm. on uh, everything. It's very, like very polarizing yeah. times. But there is like this super unhealthy group. But then there's this this super healthy group that's mm-hmm. living longer. Better nutrition than we've ever had. Better um, tracking, like with mm-hmm. all these watches yeah. and the sleep and, and everything. There's a, there's a big group of people in the middle that are just like, they're which stuck. Way do I they go? don't know which way to go. I don't want to join that cult, yeah. but I don't want to be that guy yeah. either. Mm-hmm. Like it, <laughs> so it's it's a it's a funny time. It's yeah. a it's a really funny time. But yeah. I uh, physical fitness has been super important to me. We talked about it a whole bunch of times on the podcast, but. It was a, just a, to me, it was a one-to-one relationship with really my, my wallet. Um, when I came down here to, to be a guide, it, I would go out with lots of different people. They could go as many days as they mm-hmm. wanted to. I'd go yep. four or five days and I was wiped out. Yeah. And I didn't know how to take care of myself in this environment. Mm-hmm. I didn't drink enough water. I didn't, I wasn't working out. I was eating ba- badly. I was eating poorly on the boat, but I was also 20. Yep. You know, I, I didn't know how to take care of myself. You can do that stuff when you're 20 though. I mean, you can get away well, with it. Well, Once you, you turn can. 30, 40, 50, it's like, oh man. It that, becomes progressively that water harder. water makes a big difference. Water is something that's extremely overlooked and, hmm. and kind of taken, taken for granted. And it's like, oh yeah, I had a bottle of water today all day like you're out here in the sun you're you're sweating you're working you know you gotta you gotta stay hydrated you know electrolytes are important um and then you know nutrition falls right in line with that what i would see is my my customers would come and most of the time when when i was guiding here it would be like um everyone would book for for a week like i wouldn't have very many people that would just come for a day or Mm -hmm. two um i just kind of got into this group of people that that's what they did. They booked for a week. So mm-hmm. like Monday through Sunday, I'd be fishing with, with one guy and then Monday through Sunday for the next guy. A lot of work. And you know, those guys were like super until like about Wednesday or Thursday. And then they'd have a down day mm-hmm. and then Friday they'd kind of have a down day. And then Saturday they'd kind of rebound a little bit yep. and Sunday, you know, they're pretty much wiped out by the time they go home. And I just started noticing their hydration level, what they were drinking, where they drinking soft drinks during the day, where they drink water. And what I noticed with myself, too, is like there is a cumulative dehydration effect that's happening day after day. So if you only drink, maybe you think you're doing fine on Monday and you drink some water and you're peeing and everything's, you know, it, it's it's about as much water as you would drink at home. Mm-hmm. But you're out in the sun and it's a lot more yeah. demanding out and here. And then the next day. It's just like a sponge. Mm-hmm. You're just you're just slowly drying up over the week, yeah. and well, then the, then about Thursday. Not only that, they're like, probably drinking oh. afterwards too. Yeah, some night, of them are. You know, some of them. <clears throat> I, I wasn't, mm-hmm. but um, for me, it just became like I was like looking around at some of these other fishing guys. I'm like, how are they going for two weeks in a row? I can't go for five days. Yeah. And then I started covering up more. Started wearing pants. Started wearing long sleeve shirts. Started wearing the buff on my face, mm-hmm. and Every time that I covered up, I felt better. Then I drank more water and I felt better. Mm -hmm. And then I started eating better and I felt better. Then I got more exercise and then I felt better. And then I was like, you know, at, at the, at the, 
peak was like 175 days in a row. Yeah. And so you could go from not being able to be out there for more than three or four days in a row to being able to go 175 right. days in a row. You're conditioning just by yourself. Taking care right. of yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. We do this trip. Uh, we do a surf casting trip every year, like the West Palm area. And it's, it's a lot of walking. A lot of walking. In a wetsuit? No. Just like, <laughs> no, no. Just, I'm not getting in that water. No way. <laughs> Too many sharks. We, we, we fish for sharks. And, um, you know, you're walking a few miles a day. And um, not to say that I'm in some phenomenal shape, but, I, you know, I, I work out, right? I, I train pretty hard. And um, I went on a few with a few guys that last time that didn't really train. And after day two or three, they couldn't walk anymore. They were mm. completely cramped up. You know, they weren't drinking water. And it got to the point where I was like, I, I, they physically could not fish anymore because they were so, you know, locked <laughs> up. I was like, oh, my God. Like, well, I guess I go do this by myself then, you know. And, um, you know, you don't realize how taxing some of this stuff is. You know, it looks looks cool on TV, but it's like it's physically demanding. It can know? be. And each one of these little things, like just being out in the boat, that's one form of conditioning. Doing that walking is another form of conditioning. This elk hunt that I just went on oh, is yeah. another form of conditioning. Mm -hmm. And then training every day is another form. And you're not necessarily preparing yourself just by going to the gym, spending 30, 40 minutes in the gym. That's not necessarily preparing you for long walks in the mm -hmm. hot sun where a lot of it too is like things that people aren't thinking about like what you're talking about the electrolytes and and that can be the electrolytes can mess you up worse than anything yeah. in my opinion mm -hmm. like you don't realize the importance of them you know but you realize the importance of them when you don't have yeah. any mm -hmm. and things are going bad and then you have something a half a gatorade something that has electrolytes in it and you feel like Wow. Instantly better. Yeah. I feel so much better. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, well, if if that has that effect on me when I'm empty, then what if I just stayed full all the time with, with the right electrolytes mm -hmm. and stuff like that? It's just being prepared for life. You know, you don't never know what life's going to throw at you, whether it be, you know, an unfortunate situation or something where, you know, you experience something, you roll up on something just as a person and helping is the right thing to do. You know, you don't, you never know what you're going to encounter on, on, on a daily basis. You know, there's times I've, I've rolled up on a car accident on my way to work and you help the guy out, you know, mm -hmm. you never know what you're going to have to do, whether it be pulling somebody out of a car or run into a building for something, you know, it's, it's ele that, that is elevated when you're a cop or a first responder, but you know, you never know what you're going to encounter and you want to be prepared for whatever you, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you come across. What was the draw for you to, to, to think about law enforcement as a career? September 11th. Really? Yeah. I um, I was supposed to be going into the military straight out of high school because September 11th happened my senior year of high school. So selfishly, I took the opportunity to play football in college rather than go the Marine route that I wanted to do. So once I graduated college, I was like, you know what? Being a cop is kind of the next best thing. So I was 20, pretty much 23 years old. I went into the police academy. And now I'm a count. Oh, yeah, I did uh eight years i did patrol up in the, the bronx which was very busy and then uh i put in for a counterterrorism unit it was just you know i felt like that was a step closer to you know the military and kind of doing my part in in serving you know mm -hmm. and what was the like what was it like in the police academy right after september 11th i mean you are in the epicenter there and so when you're going in are are you noticing I mean, we've had lots of people on this podcast that went to the military straight after uh, September 11th and mm -hmm. they came, you know, operators or, or whatever. But that was such a such a important day. And I'm sure that it affected lots of other people yeah. like you. So what mm -hmm. was what was the, the, the vibe at the police academy? I went then? in in 2007. So, I mean. It was talked about, you know, we talk about the people we lost there and um, they were still building the towers and all that stuff. And I don't know. It was weird. You know, I still go, I go down there every once in a while just to kind of walk around. I'll I'll walk through the, the museum and stuff. And I actually did a, a video with First Form a couple of years ago on or like for September 11th, kind of like a memorial video. And I get I don't know, man, I get emotional every time I go down there. Mm -hmm. You know, we just had the 20th, 20th anniversary and it was just like. Very emotional day. You know, I don't know. I didn't I didn't know anybody. I didn't lose anybody personally, but it was just I think um, being old enough to see that and remember it and to see the people that were like they had to choose between 
either burning or dying in the building or jumping out and taking their own life. It's like you're gonna watch that live on TV or you know, a lot of people saw it live and I have a lot of friends that are still battling cancer from that day. So it's tough, man. It's um it's a weird spot to be in. It was weird to see all that and uh it's unfortunate to see people taking that for granted. Not taking it for granted, but like overlooking it almost, you know. You go down there now and it's you know, there's the reflecting pools with all the names around it. And you'll see people throwing throwing their bags up there, eating lunch on it and stuff. And uh, the last time I was there, I spoke about this in a video last time I was there. And um, this lady's eating her lunch on the names. And this lady's, lady next to her is looking at her and shaking her head. And she looks at me and she's like, this is like my family members, whoever it was. It was this is their grave. You know, mm -hmm. I never got them back. I never saw them. You know, their body was never recovered. And this is where they're essentially buried or cremated or whatever, you know, whatever it is. And it's just, I don't know, people kind of became numb to it, I guess. So, yeah. I don't know. It's being a cop at that time, back then, it was, people were, were grateful for you. You know, in recent years, it's, you know, nobody likes you. It's a lose-lose situation. Yeah, it's been really tough to be a cop lately. Yeah. So, you're, it's kind of, it's the kind of thing where if you do your job, you know, somebody's going to record a fraction of, of the situation and they're going to, you know, criticize you for it you know if you don't do your job you need to get criticized for it so you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place and everything's got to be done a thousand percent by the book and the right way and just, you know you just got to go out there and do the right thing mm -hmm. as anyone you know it's not just cops yeah yeah it's a i don't know i i i, I saw this event that was i thought was pretty cool it was um the gi go fund i think mm -hmm. is what it's called and all these Navy SEALs were doing the swim across mm -hmm. the river yeah. and then they would go over and they would do like a hundred pull-ups here and then they'd run over here and they'd do some other stuff. And then they did that a couple of years. And then last year they opened it up to the public and said, Hey, if you want to join us to do this. Yeah. And I didn't get the memo last year, but I saw it like what after it was happening, they were put posting all this stuff. I wonder if I could do that. Like that'd be super cool. Yeah. Let me, know. Let me know if you come up. I'd had, like to. I had a couple of buddies do it. One's a SEAL. One works for, uh, I forget what agency he works for. But um, we got to swim across the Hudson River. So that was going to be my question to you. Like, no, is, that, not here for me. is that safe? <laughs> no. I mean, it's, it's safe now. It's safe now. But I mean, for me to swim that distance, I sink like a rock. Man. Well, I, this is one thing that I noticed. <clears throat> I think they let you use fins. Yeah. And, and so it's like a three mile swim. So a three mile swim is, that's, that's. It's a good swim. Yeah. And that's like a 10 mile run. Mm -hmm. That's like a, that's like a 30 mile bike. That's, yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a pretty good swim yeah. and you're going to need to train easy. for it. Oh yeah, definitely. But if you put fins on now, it's doable. Mm. Like, yeah. But if you don't train with fins, no. now you have giant blisters on your feet. I've never even swam with fins before. So, well, it's, it's, um, it's definitely different. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. It's something I'm considering. I'd like to, I'd like to do it because I, I went with my family to, to, to the site mm -hmm. when we visited New York and it was incredibly emotional. Yeah. And we also went to the Pearl Harbor, um, uh, museum, I guess mm -hmm. you call it in, um, in Hawaii, incredibly emotional. Yeah. And, and just, it's just so important, I think, to remember those things and to, to, to put yourself back in it because man, for people that are kind of younger after nine 11, like there was this unbelievable sense of community throughout mm -hmm. the entire country. Yep. And somewhere along the line, that's it got lost, got lost. I don't know. But though that time I would, I say it all the time. September 12th was like the most patriotic day ever, yes. you know? And it was, and there was unity. There was a lot of unity. This, there was no, no race, no religion. We came together as Americans and you saw it in sporting events. You know, everybody was out there cheering and waving the American flag. Didn't mm -hmm. matter what color you were, what religion you believed in. It was, we were Americans and it was, I don't know what it's going to take to bring that back, but we kind of strayed away from that. It's concerning. It is concerning because it, it certainly seems like as we're talking about like the difference between the healthy population, and the unhealthy population, it's just really on two ends of the spectrum mm. and two completely different factions and it almost seems like there's people in the middle that are prying those factions even apart further like no fat shaming and mm -hmm. and you know don't don't shame for being in in shape and mm -hmm. like those are two problems that really don't exist i, know. <laughs> I mean like there's mm -hmm. those aren't things that 
that we need to really necessarily no, worry so. about. I no. think that we've got so many other potential problems, mm -hmm. and and the and people just send, tend to be driving these two groups apart. And those are that's just an example of two groups that are are not that important. I'm mm -hmm. talking like on a political level. Oh yeah. Now you Especially have now. lots of people prying these two groups apart, and and even even this kind of silent majority that you hear about is getting pried apart to one side or the mm -hmm. other to where both sides become so extreme that the people in the middle are like well i don't really want to i don't really believe that mm -hmm. and i don't really believe that either and i feel like that's where most people are and yeah. they're stuck in the middle somewhere like what what are we doing here really right you know they don't want to be told what to do or when to do it or how to do it they just want to live their life and go, you know, there's a lot of people that take care of themselves that, are, you know, are hesitant about certain things for certain, for obvious reasons. And, uh, you know, this country was founded on freedom. That's, that's something that I'm, I'm a firm believer in is you have the freedom to do whatever you want, you know, as long as it's within the law and right. you know, you're not breaking any laws, you're free to do whatever you want. That's it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know? Criticize, yeah. protest, yeah. whatever you want. Like, you know, even if that's not people, what, what you people, believe. There's that's, people that fought and died for that freedom. That's exactly right. So you got it. And that's super important. And somewhere along the line, too, lately, just like all of a sudden, that's not important anymore. Oh, no. Freedom is not important. Yeah. And there's people advocating like, no, you don't you don't have the freedom. You, you know, you, you have responsibilities. With your, I guess you do have responsibilities with your freedom, but you still have your freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where does it come down at some point to where, I mean, you're in New York and there are all these vaccine um, deals. And I don't want this to go into like some political conversation, but I'm just wondering, like when when vaccines are mandated in a certain place for for whatever activities, go into a restaurant or whatever. And then you have people that just don't want to do that for either for health reasons or for mm -hmm. personal freedom reasons or whatever, but they still want to go in the restaurant. It causes a problem and the complete police are called and someone like yourself shows up there. Like that's gotta be a really yeah. difficult and I don't, situation. I don't think we're the ones being tasked with it. I, I mean, I'll have no part in enforcing any of that stuff. You know, that's not, I want no part of it, you know, but, um, but at some point you can get in trouble for that. Right. Like if you, yeah. if you're just like, yeah, uh, but you don't I, want to do it. You don't have to do it. Yeah. Freedom. Right. Freedom. You know, um, there's a lot of people that can't, that physically cannot take the vaccine. People mm -hmm. with heart problems, people with other problems, cardiovascular problems, they cannot take the vaccine. So, I mean, you're pretty much expelling these people from society because they have a health issue, but it's for your health. So it's, it's weird. You know, there's people that have taken responsibility for their health their entire life. And now they're being yelled at by people that have never cared about their own health for Ever, you know, and you're being told to wear a mask, get the vaccine, do this, do this, this, like this. We've we've been taking care of our ourselves. We've our health has been a priority for my entire our entire lives. We got it under control. There's people that with natural immunity. There's people with, you know, people that have got the had the uh, the virus and recovered from it, and they're totally fine. That have the antibodies, which are more effective than the the actual vaccine, you know. So, <clears throat> I don't know. As cops go responding to a scene like that. I don't know. Usually you try to amicably talk your way out of it and resolve the whole situation. Um, but I mean, these, these restaurants and these gyms are taking a beating in New York city. Yeah, They're down. I mean, they got, they got hit hard um, just cause the city shut down for almost two years. And now they're like, Oh, well, you know, if you want somebody in there, they have to be vaccinated. So now they're down between anywhere between 40 and 60% in, in business. So, wow. And the, the, you know, the rents through the roof in some of these, most of these places. I don't know how they're surviving, to be honest. I don't, I don't either. I don't know how they're surviving. It's, it's a, it's a strange place. I had, I had a show called Fitness Truth at one point and um, it was about the, the early years, days of, of CrossFit and kind of this underground thing. And then it got way bigger and it's not underground at all mm -hmm. anymore but in the early days crossfit was like super cool because it really was like underground and yeah. like the gyms were in these weird places and like, you had to it was find like the fight them club of the fitness it really kind of was and i dug that i mm -hmm. thought that was super cool like yep. you'd go to this warehouse and you'd show up and there'd be dudes with tattoos all over the place and then you're like man this is 
this is wild. Yeah. Like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Yep. And then they throw some workout in there and you would do this crazy mm -hmm. workout. It'd be dirty and dark and yeah, now, I just thought it was, was cool. for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, but the thing was, is it was for everybody then. Mm -hmm. And if you got in there and you're like, talk to these people, they were all super cool. Yeah. Like it wasn't fight club. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a community. And, yeah. but it was just held in these weird places because it was just the opposite of the globo gyms. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was like, you know, you can, this is an opportunity for you as a business owner to do something different. And yep. like, instead of like getting as many people as you possibly can to sign up. And if all those people ever showed up on the same day, there would be no way that mm -hmm. they could all fit in this gym. Yeah. On the other hand, it's like, no, you're going to be able to help these people. Mm hmm do a accomplish their goals a lot more personalized and not that the big gyms aren't helping people mm -hmm. accomplish their goals but it's like you know if you have 20 people sign up for this class 20 people should show up and mm -hmm. if they don't show up then you need to help them with their accountability yeah. and mm -hmm. things like that and there's plenty of other fitness uh initiatives that that do the same thing but just the one that i'm most familiar with was the crossfit uh world but um i'm not even sure where i was going with that but <laughs> it it was just this cool little underground thing oh, oh i was telling you about uh fitness truth and so i thought well this is a cool tv show idea like i think we could do a tv show mm -hmm. and then i got in touch with some of the people up at crossfit and they thought it was a cool idea too and so they were like what if we like sent you around to some of the gyms and they suggested some and one of them that i went to was the black box in new york and it was i mean i don't know my way around new york and new york is pretty intimidating for me because I don't know my way around. Yep. And I know that if you take a right at certain places, you mm -hmm. might end up in a bad spot. Oh, yeah. and if you take a left in certain places, you might end up in a bad spot. So you really should know where you're going. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going. And so it's kind of scary, right? Yep. For, for, for a tourist. Mm -hmm. But if you just stick around like central park or whatever, you're, you're probably okay. Or maybe I'm Usually. naive. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, so I get the address to this place. And I go there and it's like a little doorway. And then you go upstairs and there's like CrossFit gym up there. Mm -hmm. But it's above a jewelry store. <laughs> and so you couldn't drop the weights. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to do CrossFit and clean and jerks and all this stuff in this place that you can't drop the weights or they'd get super pissed up mm -hmm. downstairs. Sounds about right. Yeah. And I'm like, man, how much would this place cost? Because I've heard like these extraordinary rates for just like a little 500 square foot apartment yep. and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then here we're in this 3000 square feet of CrossFit yeah. space, which Commercial is small space, yeah. for, and, and it's mm -hmm. like, well, how, how is this working out? I think uh, I don't commercial, know the commercial it. space is more than the, the residential space down there. It's astronomical amounts of money. And, you know, I feel for these companies that are like, you know, these little mom and pop shops, gyms, and uh, all these little restaurants and stuff where it's like, you have to cut your people in half now. You know, you have to cut your business in half, essentially. And I don't, I don't know how they're paying the rent. Meanwhile, the, meanwhile the, the clientele was cut in half, too. Yeah. I mean, especially then you start applying these other things, like vaccine mandates or, mm -hmm. or I don't know, all these different things that could limit, your, limit your revenue. Yeah. It, it could be really tough. Now, what was uh, when, when New York, um, like COVID really hits? Everybody's staying home. Yeah. What was that like? It was weird. Is it a ghost you know, town? I, yeah. Was, I mean, was I it... didn't, I didn't miss any, you know, with the exception of the time that I had it, I didn't miss any days of work. I worked the whole time. I was off for a couple of weeks when I had it. I wasn't, you know, didn't really get that sick, mm -hmm. but I had it. So, but it was, it was a ghost town. You know, there's nobody there. It was weird. Everybody yeah. went from home. Broadway's shut down. Everything was shut All down. All the restaurants are shut mm -hmm. down. You, so are there, are, was there anyone on the streets or literally it was like, Wow, there, there this was, place is... There were some people. There were very unique individuals. Mm. You know, people... Uh, a lot of uh, homeless, you know, mental health and drug problems and stuff like that. But that was really it. You really? Know? Yeah. So nobody nobody's walking anywhere. Nobody's... Times Square was a, an absolute ghost town. Wow. The whole city. That had to be just the most surreal thing yeah. ever yeah. is to... Like a place that is usually so busy and mm -hmm. so crazy it's, it usually never stops it does not stop but during I, mean, I love that Times square new york is one of my favorite vacations i've ever taken with yeah. my family because it's so different than anything else we do like mm -hmm. if, if i go to montana from here it's kind of it's the same a totally speed. different like like uh climate and all mm -hmm. that and you see mountains instead of yeah. the ocean and everything 
but it's wild. Mm-hmm. And you're out in the woods or you're out on the ocean. You're you're fishing out there. Or you're fishing here. Like there's a lot of similarities, yeah. more similarities than there are differences. Yeah. And then when we go to, you know, I don't know, anywhere else, it's kind of the same speed. But when we went to New York, my whole family's eyes were as big as saucers the whole time we were there. I believe right? it. Mm-hmm. We go to a Broadway show. We take the kids to a Broadway show. Mm-hmm. They couldn't believe it. They first, the boys thought they were going to hate this thing. They were like, yeah. a Broadway show? This sounds terrible. <laughs> then they were glued to it. They could not take their eyes off of it. Mm-hmm. It was the most incredible thing. And we get up there, and it's like, I always gauge like a like a vacation. Like, if everyone had a good time and everyone found like these cool things mm-hmm. – for New York, everyone loved it. Everyone. The boys, like, the craziest thing was the things that I thought that everyone was going to like weren't the things that Everything they really liked. Opposite, like, yeah. I was like, we're going to go to a Broadway show for my daughter. Mm-hmm. And then the boys were like, yeah. Broadway show was awesome. My daughter fell asleep in the <laughs> Broadway show, right? Because it was a long day, right? So she's all There's passed lot, out. The boys, the boys were just like, that was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It was like seeing a movie, but it was like real. And they mm-hmm. were it was like, yeah, that's a Broadway show. That's the point. You just yeah. described a Broadway yep. show. <laughs> yeah. I've only seen one. And honestly, I've gone most of my adult life without ever seeing one. My fiance moved here a couple of years ago and, uh, she decided she wanted to go see uh, the Book of Mormon or something like that. Okay. And I laughed my ass off the entire <laughs> time. It was funny. It was good. I had a good time. I'll, I'll admit it. Well, but I was very hesitant at first. There's theater. I mean, it's like, you, you know, I mean, even when you're down here, it's like you're you're in Key West or you're, you're somewhere and you're like, I've heard about this Duval Street, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, I've never been there. You got to experience it. Yeah. And then and you're like, man, I've lived here how long and i've never been there mm-hmm. you know to this little museum or something that's over there and you go there and you're like oh mm-hmm. this place is pretty cool like yeah. i can see i don't want to come here every night but no. i can mm-hmm. see why people have a good time yeah. down here new york the city's good and in, in, for me at least it's good in small doses you know a day maybe a weekend mm-hmm. and you get out yeah you know, it's it's a lot of hustle and bustle it's a lot of a lot of different stuff going on, mm-hmm. you know. That's a, I like a little bit slower pace, and well, I, I like do my too, certainly for living. Oh, but yeah. for a vacation, like it was just, it was the total opposite of anything that any of us do, mm-hmm. and we all loved it. Yep, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. It was, it was just so fun. I mean, I, I look back on on our favorite vacations we've ever taken. And that was definitely one of them. Did you get pizza? Yeah. Where? Um, I don't know. I wish <laughs> yeah. I could say it. I'll be, I'll be like Michael Scott. Uh-huh. I got this little place. Yep. Sbarro. It's, yep. <laughs> it's, it's the best New York pizza. Next time you come, I'll take you to get real pizza. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm for it, man. I like, you know, I like to train. I like to take care of myself. I like to eat well, but I can also go off the rails with anybody. I mean, mm-hmm. I could probably give the rock a run for his money oh, yeah. too. I'm sure you mm-hmm. could too, man. No, anybody definitely. that trains hard, mm-hmm. you, you build up quite an appetite and you know, I'm on the 90, 10 rule. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm fine with that or mm-hmm. discipline equal freedom. Yep. Like if you got the discipline to, to be, be good most of the time. That's something I've worked on a lot in the last three or four years is balance. Cause I've been, I've completely let myself go. And then I've been a, dialed in a thousand percent where I had no life. I had no relationship. I didn't fish at all for probably three or four years. I just did not fish. I was so focused on what I was doing with the whole fitness thing. And I was like, listen, I have an opportunity within the fitness industry. I'm going to capitalize on it and, and really try to make most of it. And for me to do that, I had to be in the best possible shape. And for me to be in the best possible shape, it was like, you know, four or five hours are in the gym every day, work eight, 10 hours a day, uh, prep my meals, you know, have everything dialed in a thousand percent. You don't have time for anything else, you know? So I've been working on that balance and I think life's gotten a little bit better. Yeah. Well, when you mean you're about to get married, congratulations. Mm -hmm. You You just got, uh, met your fiance. She's awesome. Um, so when you look back on that, do you think that like that was your outlet like the fitness thing and getting that into it was like you see fishing now and that mm-hmm. was your hobby and that was kind of what t- took your mind off the job? It was, and it still is. You know, it was just, I went so far with it and I was so dialed in and so like obsessed with it. And everybody says, listen, if you want to be good at something, you want to be successful at something, you have to be completely obsessed and engulfed in it. And I was, I lived it every day, you know, and uh, not that I took it too far, but you know, I got hurt and I blew out my bicep and, you know, it's, it was kind of a wake up call for me where it was like, all right, let's take a step back and reevaluate w- what we're doing here. And, um, you know, I wasn't really, I had fun. I enjoyed everything I was doing, but I wasn't doing everything that I enjoyed in life. You know, mm-hmm. I wasn't fishing. I didn't have a relationship. I had no friends. 
other than the fitness people that I trained with. And that was it. And now, you know, you're experiencing more of life with more balance, you know? Yeah. But I do believe in that though, that in order to be successful in something, you do need to throw yourself into it and you call it the 10,000 hours, call it whatever you want. There is a certain period of time where it is necessary for you to become out of balance. Oh yeah. And then you can get to a point to where you understand things a little bit better. Maybe you get a little bit older. Maybe you get to the point to where maybe, maybe you don't have to go that hard or maybe there's room in your life Mm -hmm. for this, or maybe something, some event happens in your life that forces you to have room for other things like having kids. Yep. And then you're like, Oh, and then you have these kids Mm -hmm. and you're like, well, there is more to life than fishing and training. Mm -hmm. There is more to life than being a cop. There is more to life than whatever your job is because something else, some other outside thing that you had no idea was going to have this effect on your life. That can Mm -hmm. be getting married. That can be having a kid. Those are the two things that I see. Or it could be probably somebody, somebody in your family that, that dies probably on a, on a, the two good things and, and maybe not so good thing, but something that really rocks your world. And usually it's the kids yep. and the kids change your life in a way that nobody can prepare you for. Yeah. I'll I mean, be there in a couple of years. Probably. Yeah, I'm sure you will, man. <laughs> so. Um, but it's, it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and lots of people like I'm out on the boat with people every day and they're telling me, Oh, you know, this and this and this and this, whatever. Mm-hmm. Give me all kinds of advice. Yep. Most of it goes right over your head. Cause you're not ready for <laughs> yep. it. Right. Like mm-hmm. you don't even, you can't even absorb what they're telling yep. you because you're just not even either mature enough or you don't have like yeah. any experience to understand. Like that guy just gave me the secret to life. To everything. Like he just gave mm-hmm. me the secret to life. It's just like whoosh, right yep. over your head. You don't you even take understand. It for granted, yeah. But one of the things that I remember is people are like, yeah, when you have kids, it's going to change your life like you like you won't understand. And, you know, probably lots of other advice went over my head, but I did remember that part. Like, like I'm not going to know what's about to happen. Yeah. No matter what everybody mm-hmm. tells me, there's a personal kind of thing here that that everybody experiences a little bit different differently when you have children. And then you love those children so much and you're welcoming all this change. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the difference. Yeah. It's like there's lots of things like you get a new job or something and you're like, man, I can't train like I used to. I'm going to have to find a different way to train or I'm going to have to I can't fish like I used to. I'm going to have to only fish every other weekend or mm-hmm. this or that. But then when you have kids, you're like, man, that's awesome. Yep. I can't wait to sit at home with my kids. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and but then here's the advice I'll give you before you even have kids is that, buddy, it happens so fast. It doesn't seem fast when it's happening. It seems like it's. The longest hour of your life, maybe the longest period of your life, but then something happens and boom, they're in college. So they say, they say, uh, what is it? The years, the days get, days get longer, but years get shorter. It's <laughs> probably, it's crazy, man. It's, I, I see it now where it's like, you know, it's, I feel like the days drag, but I, I blink and the last five years went by. I'm like, where did this time go? You know, I got six years left and I retired. It's like, well. Damn, I'm 30, I think I'm 37, 36, 37. If I have kids now, like I'm going to be an old dad, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, but you're in, you're in good shape and, yeah. uh, and you'll be, you'll be fine. Yeah. And um, that, I think that's, that's a huge thing, part of taking care of yourself. It's like, you want to be there for your kids. You know, it's a big motivation for me. Like, like this, this elk hunt that I just went on was, I've been training for that all year long. You like I've trained yeah. for all kinds of other things, but that's in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. Like, First of all, I can't get hurt before that trip because that I've, I'm training for this like it's an event. Like mm-hmm. before that, I even did like a little taper. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm cutting out anything that could be dangerous. Mm-hmm. Like no you big wanna, explosive be movements. Yeah. Like, exactly. Man, it's party time over there. Yeah, um, yeah I want to be there for my kid. But it's like I've been talking about this for 20 years. Like, man, there's going to be a day when when one of my son, when one of my kids tells me that they want to do something. And I'm going to say, yeah, I'll do it. Yep. And that I was it. Want, I don't want that to have it. any limitations. I don't want to be like, I'm not I'm not physically able to do this with my kid. You know, I, obviously, when you're older, you're going to be limited, you know, just because your age. But maybe, maybe, you know, it depends. on. See, how there you, you go. That's the mindset right yeah. there. And that's like, oh, I don't know. That's. I feel like that's the norm for a lot of people, you know, man, but I don't you have to listen to this podcast. I did. I was telling you about Mike Simpson. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And that's his whole that's his whole platform is that we've all been we've all been fed a bunch of BS. Mm-hmm. We've all been sold a bill of goods that when you turn 40, you, you Your life's everybody over. just yeah. starts going downhill mm-hmm. and it's totally totally normal to have bad knees and it's totally normal yeah. to be 30 pounds overweight and it's totally normal. You know, why would you worry about all that yeah. stuff? Your eyes are going to go bad. You're you know, you're going to get on heart uh blood pressure medicine. You're going to um you're going to need to, you know, take yep. two or three medications and he's yeah. like it's not true. Yeah. Uh, and he's, I think, and I think he's living by example. He's 56 yeah. years old yep. and he's like, he's dude, he is, he's fit. He's yeah. fit. Mm-hmm. I think you're, con- I mean, personally, I think you're conditioned. There's a reason that we're all conditioned for that, you know, and you kind of have to break that, that mold and, you know, really be the best version of yourself and, and be there for your kids. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, and uh, I just think it's super important. I don't want to be held back because of physical limitations or, you know, I got, oh, I'm too old to do this or I can't do this or I can't go walk the beach and fish right. with my kid and you know, 10, 15 years or whatever. And it all is. that's within your control. Yeah. It's totally within your control. Mm-hmm. So here's the question. You got six years until you retire. What are you going to do when you retire? You thought about it? Do you think about that? I have thought about it. I'll probably um, try to still, honestly, I'll still try to do something in the fitness industry, something where I'm able to help people. And, um, probably be able to fit in a lot more fishing. So <laughs> uh, it'll be a balance between helping people with fitness and, you know, going on a few fishing trips a year. Nice. So. And um, what, what, what is it like when you, when you help people, you start this initiative, you see people, um, what does that do for you? It's, it's, uh, it's very satisfying, you know, to see, I've helped a bunch of people with, uh, you know, Forest Forest Farm's got an app. We help a lot of people through that. And to see the the change, not only the physical change, but the, the mental change, the mindset shift, you know, where they don't necessarily need the app anymore to, to, you know, get a workout or to track their macros. They just automatically know what to eat and what to avoid. You know, it's, it's, it's the making smarter choices, um, whether it be food or training or just overall lifestyle changes. You know, it's, uh, it's gratifying to see them be able to do that stuff on their own, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Helping people is certainly incredibly rewarding. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things that that I miss most about um, guiding daily is there was this immediate feedback. Yeah, that you take somebody that maybe they've been fishing a lot. I mean, it could be a beginner that doesn't know how to fish, or it could be a guy that is is trying to catch this permit on fly, or trying mm-hmm. to catch this grand slam, or trying to win his first fishing tournament, or something, and and is willing to put in the work. And they put in the work and they do all this stuff and you see them getting better and better and better. And then it happens for them. And man, the look on that person's face when Mm -hmm. they turn to you and give you that handshake and just, I mean, literally I've seen grown men that own giant companies with tears in their eyes because they just caught their first bonefish or their Mm -hmm. first tarpon or their first permit. And, and to be a part of that, is amazing to be the one that made the call and to be the one that decided this is where we're going and this is the time that we're going to be there and we're going to pull exactly this way and I'm going to set this up for this person and I'm going to it's almost like a uh, it's almost like you're setting the you stage, set the stage up. for it yeah right and mm-hmm. then 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 they have to pull the trigger mm-hmm. right it's so rewarding and it's so satisfying and that's one of the big things that I miss about daily guiding mm-hmm. is just you know, the, there's there's still satisfaction in helping people, and there's still satisfaction in 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 with with my kids seeing them achieve things, but it's not this everyday thing, yeah. and and the and believe me, the everyday thing also comes with pitfalls and downfalls, oh, yeah. and it's not like every day you get to catch somebody their first permit. Yeah. There's plenty of days where, mm-hmm. like yesterday, where it didn't exactly <laughs> turn out like we wanted to, and it's super disappointing because as 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 rewarding as it is and it's almost like it's almost like a dopamine high right like you want this person to get this Mm -hmm. amazing thing this first this this biggest this whatever it is and then when that doesn't happen man it's as depressing for the guide as it is for the angler maybe worse yeah i would imagine i would imagine it's worse yeah because then you start piling on yourself like if i had gone over there Mm -hmm. if i had done this or you know a lot of factors that come into play yeah i know Mm -hmm. but it's it's you know i don't know i was i was yesterday as we we started to go out it started raining and so 
I was like, oh man. And then we had some good options that were do- dead into the rain. And it's like, uh, so we just kill a little time over here and mm-hmm. try to do this and that. And then, then every minute that's ticking by is like the window is closing yep. on what we were trying to do. And it's like, oh, she man. got to play the wind, the <laughs> rain, the tide, the time. It's, there's a lot that goes into it, you know, and some people understand it. Some people don't. Yeah. But, you know, there's, I know, I know there's a lot that goes into it. You know, there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of stuff that could go wrong and there's a lot of stuff that could go right. So. That's why it's fishing. And that's why you got to pay your dues. Yep. Like, that's what people are always, what's the secret to catching, you know, this or catching that? Or it's like, man, you got to pay your dues. Yep. You got to go out there because most days it's not going to happen. And then mm-hmm. finally it will, it will happen for you. Yeah. And that's cool, man. Yeah. Well, I'm super excited that you were down here. It's nice to get to know you finally yeah, after following you on, on social media. Yeah. And, we've been following uh, each other a while, man. It's, it's so cool to, to be down here with you guys. Yeah. Was, I had such a blast yesterday, regardless of weather conditions. <laughs> and, you know, we made it happen. We made it come together at the end and I had a blast. Yeah. Absolute blast. Well, thanks for coming thanks. and thanks for, for all you do to help people and certainly all you do to, to help the first responders. That's, that's Thank super, you. that's, a, that's an amazing, um, platform to be standing on and being able to, I, I think that you've only begun to help those guys. Thank you. Yeah, man. We'll see. All right. Keep it going. If uh, if you want to follow Mike, um, no donuts here. Yep. It's the best. It's the best Instagram <laughs> hashtag going. Um, no donuts here. And then your Facebook, too. or what? Yeah. Facebook is uh, Michael. No donuts here. Um, I'm much more active on Instagram, though. Mm-hmm. Sure. And then the first form outdoors. I've seen you on that page. Yeah. A we're going to try to get the first form outdoors thing going. Um, hoping to get it going on YouTube. Me and my buddy Mike Trotter are going to make mm-hmm. a run at this thing and, and really see what happens. Kind of do like a outdoors comedy slash educational videos video series so i think it'll be a lot of fun there you go well you can come down here here and film with us anytime you want i just uh i'm on that first form thing myself Mm -hmm. not to the level that you are but i like their products and and um it seems seems like a really amazing company yeah they're the best they're great yeah great products great people all right mike thanks appreciate it man thank you see you